Hello, today we're with Martin Jennings, owner, distiller and creator of uh, Apothecary Gin and Soapbox Spirits. So Martin, thank you for coming. Um, we've been trying to get you here for ages to tell us a little bit about your gin. Um, so firstly, I know you've had a long and illustrious career in the wine and spirits industry, but what made you leap into uh, becoming a distiller of gin? Uh, well, there's a couple of things actually that contributed to that. And the main one really was that my tenure at a previous employer had really got to a point where there wasn't really a route of progression. Um, plus the business had been sold to a new owner and therefore things were changing. So there was a lot of change afoot. And at that point in time, I had access to all the industry data, which told me that gin in particular and in spirits was growing rapidly and looked forecast to growth for at least five to 10 years. And the biggest area of growth or the most sustainable area of growth within that category was in the premium or super premium area. So I had all that information. I also had some theoretical knowledge having never distilled practically before, but in theory, I knew the process through my WSET connections and so on. And therefore it seemed to me like a logical um, and perhaps interesting and enjoyable route to go down rather than looking for another job. Right. Okay. So, um, you become a distiller. Your first uh, a gin, your first um, a creation is Apothecary Original. Yes. And I know this immediately went on to win double gold at the World Championships yeah. IWSC in San Francisco. So could you tell us a little bit about your, your, your journey there and your, your obvious delight at that happening? Yeah, well, the original was obviously the first thing that, that we did. And, and actually the creation of that was, it took a while but that was mainly because HMRC took so long to issue a license for distilling. But once we got to that point of distilling, there was a fairly rapid process of limiting the number of things that I wanted in it and how I wanted the gin to evolve and how I wanted it to be. And the real criteria for it was it wanted to fulfill two different things. One, one was that we could create something that was a good sipping gin, so on its own, just with ice, uh, but also something that when mixed with tonic, which most people do, it would still have a flavor and aroma that you could easily detect. So very often in a bar experience, for example, you might go to a bar and order a gin and tonic and you might not be able to smell and taste the gin quite as much as you might like. A number of reasons for that, one of which obviously is the intensity of the gin, the other is obviously the dilution um, that you might have too much tonic. But notwithstanding that, I wanted to create something that would really stand up in tonic. So they were the two main elements. And then with my wine background, I wanted to create something that took you on a flavor and aroma journey, much the same as a decent glass of uh, an aromatic white wine, for example. Um, so you, you get interested by the aroma initially, then you have an interesting palate that is satisfying, but it finishes dry, which leaves your palate refreshed and ready for another one. Obviously that's the holy grail of any drink really, <laughs> yeah. uh, but particularly in something like a dry white wine, yeah. but also in something like a spirit such as gin. Yeah. So that was kind of the way it went. And then it was down to choosing the botanicals. Yeah. I probably distilled around about a hundred different botanicals before obviously drilling them down to maybe 50 yeah. and then down to 30 and then 20 <laughs> and then to the final 10 yeah. and really when I got to the last six there was only one really that was wrong and that was fennel yep. and unfortunately I really like fennel and I wanted to keep it in yeah. but I couldn't because it was overpowering the other five yeah. so the five we've ended up with obviously a lemon peel lavender which is the key aromatic yeah. um, and then you've got black mulberries which give it a really smooth sort of almost a hint of red fruit as well yeah. tilia flowers and of course juniper being the base and the main ingredient yeah. Right, and it's certainly a delicious uh, gin. It's, it's my absolute favorite still. Um, but I know um, its organic credentials are very important to you. Mm. I know you source your uh, botanicals very carefully yeah. and, you, and you like to uh, ensure your gins meet organic criteria. So yeah. is that a difficult thing for a distiller to, to do? Uh, it, it is somewhat difficult in terms of the paperwork side of things, but I mean, anyone can get around that eventually. It's just more difficult in terms of sourcing the ingredients that you want in the quantities that you want, to be honest. Um, and being a very small producer, it's perhaps more difficult because you're not buying enough bulk or quantity to get a, de a decent price. So you have to pay a bit more. Um, and I don't mind that. And I, I have to pass that on to consumer, obviously, because it's, it's part of the cost of the product. But actually, it, it really works. Uh, initially, that we weren't using um, neutral spirit that was organic. It was a simple logistical reason for that, which was that we couldn't get it in a small enough quantity in the UK. Right. Uh, even now, we can't use UK produced um, organic spirit because it's not produced in the UK that we can access. 
So we have to buy it from either Italy or Germany, depending on which market is offering it at the right price or yeah. available at the time. Yeah. Um, but that's good. It's 100% wheat. It is organic and it's certified. We're also a certified organic importer now on the EU traces system because our juniper, which is also certified organic, obviously, comes from um, Serbia, which is outside the EU. So we've had to go through additional paperwork just to be able to import that. Uh, so nothing is easy, but, but as, as they say, if it was easy, everyone would do it. Um, and if it's worth doing, it might be hard work, but it's going to pay off in the end. And so that's kind of the reasoning behind it. The other thing is that there are only a handful still of producers in the UK that are producing an organic certified gin. So although it's not necessarily a USP, it does separate you from the crowd. Yes. So it's not saying that organic is better in terms of taste or, or whatever, although yeah. I would argue it might be. It, it's more about sustainability and the future. And I'm glad to say that more and more gins are coming onto the market that are organic. Yeah. And more and more of those that weren't are converting to organic. So that's actually a really positive thing. We've done it for two years or so. Right. So Great. So we'll put Pothecary Original to one side for a moment okay. and talk about your next two creations, which yeah. were your Sicilian blend. Yeah. Which I know has gentian root and roasted almonds in. Yes. Yep. And your Thai blend, yes. uh, which I know very little about the botanicals, okay. <laughs> apart from I think there's uh, coconut. Yeah. Uh, it's quite tropical, yeah. as you might imagine. So, but... <laughs> um, could you tell us a little bit about these two? Yes. Because they're entirely different to yeah, your original, aren't they? Yeah. You're quite right. So, the idea was we had the original for about, well, in fact, exactly 12 months on its own. We only had one product for a 12 month period. Uh, and during that period, doing events and consumer tastings and trade tastings and so on, the feedback was, if you don't like floral gin, because this is obviously lavender initially on the aromatic side, if you don't like floral style gin or lavender, yep. exactly lavender, then it's not the gin for you, no matter how good it is or whether it's organic or not is irrelevant. And that's a fair point. And so when people said that, we would ask, well, what sort of gin do you like? And the majority of answers were something that was citrus based. And citrus gin is obviously something that's historically very popular and currently obviously as well. So the next creation came as a result of that feedback and it uses part of the sort of thinking behind the original one uh, in as much that it has some of the organic um, Sicilian lemon peel in it, but also orange from the same producer. So we now have orange as the dominant aromatic, but also there's some lemon in there. And then as you say, organic Sicilian almonds, hence this is sort of Sicilian yep. um, sort of edge to it. And the style of it is obviously different to this because of the gentian root and also those citrus aromatics. So the gentian root is something quite unique, which gives it a very woody kind of bitter character on the finish. And although it's not the most powerful in terms of alcohol in the range, it's certainly the most powerful in terms of aroma and flavor particularly. And that comes down to the gentian root. Um, the juniper is exactly the same for all four gins that I produce currently. And, and always has been the same juniper base actually. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's no difference in terms of the juniper. It's simply that mix of botanicals and it, it's more citrus dominated, but with that twist in the tail, which is the gentian root. Yeah. The thing about the Sicilian blend is it's 47% ABV, whereas the original is 44.8. And that lends itself, and because of the power of the flavor and aroma, lends itself towards cocktails. And in particular, the Negroni. Yeah. So we just, we just had Negroni week actually, and I featured it quite a lot on social media because of that. Yeah. Because with Campari and with Rosso Vermouth, it makes a fantastic Beautiful. Negroni. Yes. So that's, that's Sicilian blend. Yep. Um, again, that's certified organic, organic now by Soil Association as well. Yeah. So these two are certified organic by Soil Association. Yeah. Uh, Thai blend, now Thai blend is, is really the odd one out in the four. Yeah. Um, and actually as a limited edition, it will come to the end and I probably won't repeat it. Right. It's the, it's the one that I wouldn't repeat for the reasons that it doesn't necessarily fit quite in the same way that the others do. Um, so these two fit on the basis that they're organic, there are only five botanicals in each, so it's fairly stripped back. Um, plus, there's a reason for doing this one in, in as much that it contrasts quite nicely with the original. So they work quite nicely together. This one, however, is, is a bit out on a limb. The other reason that it doesn't work is because none of the botanicals that are used in this are actually from Thailand. So right. although it's Thai blend, it's, it's kind of, yeah. it's, um, it's yeah. what I don't like about marketing. In fact, it's a, it's a Thai style yes. blend. And, and that's something that I'm not really very keen on. Uh, right. The only reason it exists in all honesty is because we did a collaboration with a Thai restaurant chain. Uh, they wanted a Thai yeah. blend gin for their restaurant. Yes. They wanted it bespoke with their own label. Yeah. They weren't willing to pay 
quite what they ought for a bespoke gin. So as a result, I, uh, I made our own one, which I could then sell as a limited edition and change theirs slightly by reducing the ABV yeah. and adding a stick of organic lemongrass into their particular product. Yeah. So theirs is unique and different to ours, albeit slightly, but nonetheless, it's their product and this is our product. Yeah. Um, so that's why that one exists. Yeah. Uh, the botanical mix in this, uh, everyone in instantly thinks when they see it or taste it or smell it, that there's lemongrass in there. That's yeah. the only thing that's actually missing. Uh, so there, there is no lemongrass <laughs> in the tie blend. It's actually mango, pineapple, lime, coconut, which is toasted before it's distilled. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of fresh coriander leaf, fresh turmeric root, and fresh ginger root. Right. So it's when people ask what style it is, I say, well, it's it's tropical fruit yeah. and a little bit of warming spice. Yeah. People quite often mistake it for um, sort of curry spice. Yeah. You know, they might think it's going to be that, but it's not that. It's it's not hot and it's not spicy in that sense. Yeah. So it's completely different in terms of style to something like opir, for example, yes. which is more of that curry and spice, curry cardamom, spice cumin, cumin, that sort of thing. Yeah. So it is quite a good product, and I. Don't have a dislike for it, yeah. but it doesn't necessarily fit quite with the group. Um, so, yeah. so it's, it, go it, it's been and it's probably going to go, yeah. and it won't. It won't necessarily come back. Okay. So we come on to the last of of your uh, little uh, yeah. set here. Yeah. Now, we think this is the perfect gin and tonic gin. Right. And I know you've stripped this back like yeah. no gin before. This yeah. is a fantastic gin. Yeah. And. I know it's only got three botanicals in yes. here, um, so I'll let you explain the okay. uh, reason behind it, the okay. thing behind it, uh, and it works beautifully. It just really well, is good. a lovely gin, your, your that, Trinity. I'm pleased to hear that. that <laughs> the idea behind Trinity is it, it's a little bit of a um, self-indulgent sort of reaction to the market, if you like. So the market has gone a little bit crazy in gin, so you see things like unicorn tears, Yes, um, you do. All sorts of rhubarb and custard. Yes. Uh, what was the most recent one? Was um, Battenberg cake gin yes. or, or something Bakewell like that? Tart. Bakewell tart. Recently, yeah, yes. recently. So you know, and and they're not they're not technically mm. gin. Mm. So a lot of them don't qualify in a number of ways, yeah. but they still have the word gin yeah. in large letters yeah. on the front label. Because there's a juniper berry in there. Well, there might be, but <laughs> unfortunately, that doesn't qualify them as gin. So the qualification to be a gin is a minimum 37.5% ABV. Yes. Many of them are below that. Yeah. The ones that have got cake elements and so on are yeah. below that usually. Yeah. Yeah. And what they do is they put the word gin in bold and then they put the word liqueur underneath yeah. it, which basically gets them out of yeah. the trap of being yeah. considered a technically a labeling of, of, of yeah. gin. But they still are selling themselves on the back of the gin market. Uh, and also the other thing is that juniper has to be evident both on the aroma and the flavor profile in order for it to qualify uh, in a taste test as a gin yep. otherwise it's flavored vodka yes. so with that in mind my reaction to the market uh, was well let's let's just strip it back to what are the basic elements of gin and i've subsequently had a rethink on this i'll have to say <laughs> but for the time being when i was creating this back in february mm. the thinking was the, the basic elements are well clearly juniper mm. so it has to have juniper in order to have the flavor and aroma of juniper to qualify as a gin Minimum 37.5% ABV, which is not really a problem for me because mm -hmm. the lowest one I have is 44.8, yes. so that's not really an issue. Um, but beyond that, you need the next most um, used botanical, if I can call it that, is coriander seed. And the third most common uh, botanical is citrus of some variety. Yes. And the citrus element in gins varies enormously. So you can have anything from grapefruit to lime to orange, lemon, bergamot, or whatever. In this case, it's bergamot. And the reason I chose bergamot is twofold. One, because I think bergamot is interesting and underused, and two, um, because all the others are overused almost. Right. So it kind of makes it a little bit more different. Plus, on top of that, there's actually a third thing I've yeah. just remembered, is that bergamot is a, a strange fruit in its own right. Yeah. So it's a hybrid between an orange and a lemon. Yes. And therefore you get elements of both, yes. but by only using one citrus fruit. So that's kind of interesting for me. Um, so I thought, Bergamot would be good. Yeah. Juniper clearly is exactly the same as I use in the rest of the, of the gins yeah. um, as a base. And the coriander seed is something that is organic, obviously, but it's from Egypt. It happens to be from Egypt at the moment. It doesn't have to be from Egypt. But to be honest with you, I've tried a number of different coriander seed samples and I haven't really found much variation. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there are some that are different, but I've, I've not spent an awful lot of time exploring that. Yeah. Um, but the Egyptian one works for me. So what you tend to get is an absolutely classic stripped back three elements gin. Yep. So hence the name Trinity. Yep. Uh, there are only three elements to it. 
It's 49% ABV, so it, in terms of alcohol, it's, it's packing a bit of a punch, but it's not um, hot or uh, it doesn't have a harsh burn. In actual fact, it's quite smooth, even considering it's 49%. So it works, and the point was to make a stripped back classic gin, and if you don't like that, I, I would like wager gin. that you don't like gin. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So that was the whole point. Yeah. So get, get rid of all the colour, the flavour, the sugar, the, yeah. all the other added yeah. sort of gimmicks, if you like. Yeah. And that is what gin should taste and smell like. Exactly. And, and as you say, yeah. to make a classic G&T simply yeah. with yeah. Indian tonic and a slice of or a wedge yeah. or a zest of lemon yeah. or orange, because yeah. they both work equally well. Yeah. Perfect. Keep it simple. It yeah. works a treat. Yeah. It works beautifully. So there are your range of gins. We love yeah. them all. My favourite, as I say before, is this one. I could yeah. drink it all day long, although I shouldn't, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the benefit of this one is the only one of the four that I would recommend as a sipping gin. Yes. So it's quite versatile yeah. that you can have it as an after-dinner drink in a tumbler with ice, yeah. or you can have it as a dry martini yeah. pre-dinner, yeah. or you can have it with tonic yeah. during dinner. I mean, yeah. you know. Yeah. You I just, I, I love the floral note. I love right. the lavender note, which I never thought I would. No. But in, in the gin, in your gin, it, it's just beautiful, the, just lovely. The key to all of them yeah. is, is the process, and the process is obviously multi-shot. And the multi-shot process just means you're distilling individual botanicals on their own yeah. and you get an absolute clarity of flavour and aroma for each before you then blend yeah. and then dilute. Yeah. If you're making a London dry gin, yeah. you have to put all of your botanicals yeah. in the Hope same the pot. Best, really. Yeah, and it's yeah. much more difficult to get them to not fight each other yeah. or clash yeah. or and so on. And so most traditional, if I can call them traditional distillers, probably a bit, yeah. Most of the uh, sort of old school distillers that yeah. make London dry would sort of veer away from lavender in particular because lavender doesn't really play well with others yeah. and it tends to give a soapy kind of mm -hmm. texture and, and, and flavour that you don't really want in your gin. Yeah. So doing it on its own means we get a real clarity of aroma and flavour that just works, works for all of them. It certainly does. So moving on from gin, I know you have a, a new project uh, yeah. in the pipeline or not even the pipeline because uh, you now are a trainer and examiner for the uh, Wine and Spirits Educational Trust That's right. in both wines and spirits. Yep. And being one of your uh, students, yes. recently uh, graduate, passed my exam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yes, um, is, is this something you're going to pursue more and is this a, a, a developing trend well, for you I'm now? I'm hoping to. Yep. There, is, there is a trend of um, education within the spirits and the wine industry, to be fair, and there has been for a long, a long time. And the Wine and Spirits Education Trust has grown enormously in the, the 25 or so years that I've been involved with them. Yeah. Um, and it's just going to continue to grow because they are basically accepted as the industry standard for qualification in wines and spirits. Yeah. So as a, an approved educator um, and an approved program provider, yeah. it means there are obviously going to be more and more potential clients for me yes. um, to deliver um, courses to. Yeah. And spirits is growing. Gin particularly has grown over the last four or five years, as we know, or 10 years, in fact. Yeah. But its spirits in general have, have also grown alongside gin, not perhaps to the same extent, but that is continuing to grow. Things like rum are growing again and, and tequila and various other things. And that, as that continues, the Wine and Spirit Education Trust have now, uh, in August this year, they're releasing level three in spirits. Yep. They will hold on to that course exclusively for Bermondsey and they'll deliver it themselves only until probably January or February in 2020. Yep. Then they'll allow, allow approved program providers like myself yep. to start delivering it to students of which, if you can imagine how many have done the level two already yeah. that want to do the level three, yeah. there's likely to be quite a few. Um, so hopefully that, that will help yeah. and we'll start to get more student numbers coming through yeah. and you'll have better qualified everybody basically in the industry, yeah. which is only a good thing. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Right, thank you, Martin. Thank you You're for welcome. coming. Thank you for coming to the Christchurch Confectioner and Gin Shop and giving us your time. And we look forward to uh, selling many more bottles of apothecary gin. Excellent. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Martin. Okay. I'd just like to thank Martin once again for giving up his time and coming to the shop to give us his expertise and insight into the fantastic range of Soapbox Spirits gins. Uh, I will be reviewing all of Martin's gins in forthcoming episodes on Gin Opinion, so if you like what you see, please click the link and subscribe and click the bell, and these reviews when I do them will come straight to you. We'd love to see you here again on Gin Opinion, where we have lots more artisan gin we'd love to champion.